uh, purposes for your exam book. Design journals, the next thing I wanted to say was uh, that you're, uh, as of last week, I hope, starting to keep a design journal. And that is every week you just write down some things about the week that's just happened. And I thought I should be really clear about what things we want you to write down, because I've been reading through people's design journals, and some of you all noticed I've started making comments in some of yours, uh, and some of them are just fantastic. I don't need you to write a lot. I see some people writing lots and lots, and I'm worrying that they're doing too much. I don't need you to write lots, and I don't really need to know what happened during the week. It's not like a transcription of the week. I need to know what thoughts you had about design during the week. So if you had some insight in the lecture, or we learned something new about design, write that down. Or you're doing something on your project, and something design related happens with your project, we decided we'd change from this design to that design for these reasons, or something like that. That's what we want to know about in your journal. So at the end of the course, reading back over the journal, it should be a, it should be a design journal. It should be a reflection of all your thoughts as a designer as you've gone through the course. So thoughts about the projects, about the design tasks, or just about things you've learned or noticed or experienced. For example, was it Dave? Wave at me. Who, who was it? Yeah. Yeah, Dave um, just pointed out that my traffic lollipop that I'd been touting as an example of good design isn't actually, it still has a design flaw. What was the design flaw? Uh, if um, there's two of them and one person's facing you and the other one's not, if they're telling both sides to go, they're also at the same time telling you to go and then stop. Because you'll say slow or go, and then you go up a bit and there's another sign saying stop. Spot on. That's right. The synchronization, which we were really impressed with, was the sort of physical synchronization with the different things on different sides, stopping the bad case ever arising, only works if there's only one of them. If you've got two, they're not, they're not synchronized together. And that's a pain. And you notice that because you were driving home and it happened. <laughs> so we're lucky to have you with us today. <laughs> Thank you. Um, OK. Uh, now, in the USA at the moment, there's a big debate about health care. And they're talking on and on and on about healthcare and the healthcare bill and all that sort of stuff. And I've been watching some of the debate with interest, just because I like watching people debate, really. And I saw an interesting one this morning with one guy saying he was sick of all these people complaining about the extra taxes, because this was a good thing for the country and it was good for everyone. And why are these people just complaining about taxes, that it's costing a bit more? And then someone else wrote back saying, well, why should my taxes have to pay for your healthcare? And then they got into this big sort of argument. And it essentially turned into a rich versus poor argument. And the poor people were saying, or the, the um, one side were saying, you rich bastards, you don't want to pay taxes, but those taxes help everyone. And you're really privileged, and you've had this privileged life, and you're just sucking off everyone else and soaking it all up. And then the rich people are saying, no, I deserve this because I earned this. I did all this hard work. It's mine. It's my dollars. I earn it. I can spend it how I want. And that seems to be the debate. And both sides feel very strongly about their position. And then one of the rich people said, um, something like, I earn this money so I should be able to spend it however I want. And then another person made the remark that every time he's spoken to someone who said that, when they've grilled them a bit closer, it's turned out they've had rich parents. And they haven't really made all the money themselves. And the parents funded them through uni, and the parents funded them through college, and the parents sent them to expensive schools, and the parents did all this and that and the other. And, and, one, and then they got into a debate about that, and someone's saying, so what if my parents help me out because everything I do now is I'm earning and you know, that's past. And then the other side saying, but the fact that your parents paid you through uni and sent you to Stanford and bought you that car, that's giving you an advantage. That's helping you earn that money now. Did you see this argument? It's an interesting argument. And I was thinking about that. Uh, and the funniest one was some person was saying he had a friend who was really rich who had a sticker on his car saying, I, I earned it. I'll decide how I spend it. And it was a bumper bar sticker on his very expensive car. And his friend said the thing that he always thought was funny was that was a car his parents bought him while he was at college. So, uh, so, so that was just interesting. So I was thinking about that, and it reminded me of India. Because when I was about your age, I went to India. And I was wandering around, uh, around Christmas, in a very beautiful part of India. And uh, I was high in a mountain, in fact. And I was in a mountain. And, <laughs> and it was New Year's Eve, and I love chess. At that stage, I was going through an obsessive chess phase. And none of the people traveling with me wanted to play chess with me, bizarrely. Uh, they wanted to do other things like see sights. And I found this Indian boy who was about my age who loved playing chess. 
and he, he worked in the guest house where I was staying. And we'd just play chess all the time. Whenever there's spare time, we'd sit up playing chess. And there's a photo that my girlfriend took of me on uh, New Year's morning, I think it was, sitting up with the sun rising behind us and mountains stretching all this, so gorgeous, on top of the world. And me on this rickety little table sitting on one side and the Indian guy on the other side. And we're just playing chess, just looking really furiously. And I became really good friends with him and we chatted and all sorts of things. And, and he told me about his life and his aspirations and what he wanted to do. And I suddenly, it struck me that I was uh, not a privileged, particularly privileged person in Australia, but here I was flying out to his country and I could fly wherever I wanted and go wherever I wanted and this was a holiday for me and I was going to go back to uni and I was going to have a comfortable job and get a car and health insurance and things. And this guy, the best he could ever hope for would be, I don't know, he was, his dream was to save up and buy his own motorbike. And he would beat me in chess, he was smarter than me, but he would never be able to fly to my country. I thought, wow, that's weird. So it's just that I was lucky. I was just born in this spot and it just, through no benefit or privilege or skill of my own, I'm just so precious and endowed and lucky. And he, probably even more worthy than me, is born in another spot and he's going to be lucky if he owns a motorbike. And I was really shaken by that and it changed all my political views. I remember coming home thinking, that's not right, that's not right, it's not right. And this is what we call inheritance. <laughs> Inheritance is when you just get something and you don't have to do any work for it. Now, in life, it's not right, it's not right, it's not right. But in programming, it's fantastic. <laughs> because in programming, uh, if you had to do everything from scratch, there's so much to do, you'd be working all the time. It's much nicer if it's just all done for you. Wouldn't that be fantastic? So inheritance is sort of going to explore this idea. It's going to be this idea of how we can make things better by just getting stuff we don't deserve, really, that someone else does for us. Uh, now, there's a danger with inheritance, and we better talk about that, and that's the same danger we notice with James Packer. Now, as you know, the Packers are a very wealthy family, and for generations they've been the wealthiest people in Australia. And old Kerry Packer was very, very, he was number one man, I think, and he, I think when he died he, owned something, he had something like $7 billion worth of assets. And he was famous for never wanting to pay tax and always having fights with the ATO because it was his money. He earned it. Uh, well, he inherited it from his dad. And um, his son, Jamie Packer, James Packer, took over the business. And um, he started running OneTel. He was then the wealthiest man in Australia. He started running OneTel and all that sort of stuff. Well, that unfortunately went under. It was a bad decision. He lost about a billion dollars. He joined the, joined the Church of Scientology. Uh, made a series of bad investment decisions and within a couple of years he was down to the third richest man in Australia. And then um, I understand that in 19, 2007 or so, uh, the last time I could find any data on how much he was earning, he's, he's way off the list. I think he only earns about $3 billion now. And this is what I often noticed with uh, the rich children of, my, uh, well, uh, of wealthy parents who are my friends, that the parents did a lot of hard work and really deserved to get lots of money, yeah, if you think hard work deserves money. But then the kids came along and they weren't really good. They just sort of got it for no real reason. But they frittered it away and they lost it and they blew it because they were sort of hopeless, really, in a way. They weren't as good as their parents. They had this unfair start, but their hopelessness sort of sucked it away from them. And I want you to notice that with inheritance in programming, we've got the same sort of problem, that someone can write something fantastic and we inherit it, but then we can stuff it up. And in fact, the scope for stuffing it up seems to be even bigger than if we wrote it ourselves. So inheritance is on the one hand going to give us a blessing, but on the other hand, it's going to give us a danger and sort of tempt us into writing bad code that's going to stuff up. So that's the two tensions we're going to try and resolve today. Okay. Um, uh, I think the problem that inheritance was to solve was the problem of code reuse that I'm sure you've heard this over and over again, that in other engineering disciplines, things get reused. Um, uh, someone invents a, a truss, a way of constructing wood in a certain way that's really strong, and then everyone else does that. And if you're building a house, you don't have to go and build your own trusses. You just go to the hardware store and grab trusses that other people have made, and you can use them. We call that reuse. The same thing you can just use over and over again without you having to do it yourself. And it would be nice in software if that was the case. And the pain in software, of course, is that every time we face a problem, we sort of clear the decks and start writing from scratch. Even though in our hearts we know probably this has happened a million times around the world with a million almost identical problems with this one, it's too hard to find that solution and to twiddle it and to integrate it and to put it in your own. Often it's just easier, oh, I'll just throw it away and start again. And that's a huge waste of effort, isn't it, really? 
A lot of people can put a lot of thought and time into doing something and then it just gets thrown away and the next person does it and the next person does it and instead of mankind going as far as we can, standing on each other's shoulders and all that sort of stuff, head of shul shoulders of giants and so on, we um, just reinvent the thing over and over again. It's a pain in the bum. So, uh, inheritance was this sort of idea that uh, is, I think the problem it was to solve was, was that. That's certainly how Bertram Meyer puts it, the guy whose book I showed you last week. Bertram Meyer talks about this thing called the open-closed principle. And the open-closed principle goes something like this. When you write a piece of software, you want it to be open and you want it to be closed. And this is a dilemma. You want it to be open for extension. So, you write something to reverse the audio in web files. We'd like it if someone wants to reverse the audio in an MP3 or an OG file or something like that, that they can reuse your code and just extend it. We'd like it to be open for that. We'd like people to be able to add new features and build on your existing code. But we don't want to make everything open and let everyone fiddle with everything because what does that violate? Abstraction. And what's the problem with violating abstraction of letting everyone fiddle with everything? It gets messy and things break. You set something up really delicately and nicely yourself and some idiot comes along and stomps all over it because they don't understand how everything fits with everything else. We really, once something's right and finished and working and tested, we want to be able to seal it and lock it and weld it shut and no one monkeys with it. That's a unit that's safe now that can be used and don't go fooling with that, just use it. So we, we want it to be open for extension. But we want it to be closed for modification. And it's very hard to do that because either you give people the source and it's open for both or you keep the source secret and it's closed for both or you have a compiler that locks it down and it's closed for both or you have some sort of general interpreted global variable environment and every, it's open for both. It's very hard to get one or the other. Well, so, so Maya suggests object-oriented programming is a way of achieving these objectives, of simultaneous, seemingly conflicting objectives of being open and closed. So the idea being we want to write some code and we want it to be locked down and no one can monkey with it, but we'd also like someone to be able to add extra features to it without monkeying with it. And this notion is called inheritance. Let me show you what it looks like. Uh, I did erase something just then, didn't I? <laughs> My subconscious hiding things around the room. Let's put on the lights too. So, Suppose you wrote um, um, Suppose you wrote a class to be uh, a chess game. You're doing chess now, aren't you? So you wrote some sort of chess class. And you, you get it working and all the methods work and everything's checked and unit tested and it's working and you put it in a class and you lock it up. Now, I don't want anyone to monkey with that class. But I do want people to be able to extend that class. Like, suppose we think of a new chess question. Uh, there's one um, puzzle that uh, I set one year called Complete Piece, where you had to work out a way of putting all the chess pieces on the board so that no piece was attacking any other piece. And it's quite hard to do that. So we'd like our chess program, instead of, as well as being able to answer questions about mate and one and mate and two, we'd like it to be able to solve the complete peace problem. And we'd probably also like it to solve the knight's tour problem and the end queen's problem and all those sorts of problems. So we might want to give it extra challenges. But we don't want to monkey with it. So in object orientation, here's what we do. We make a new thing called a, I don't know, super, this was called, what, this actually wasn't called chess, was it? What was it called? Chess, chess thinker or something. Something that could think about chess. We could call this a, a chess, what's even better than a thinker? A doer. <laughs> uh, genius. genius, monkey. <laughs> a fish. Uh, uh, okay, let's go chess genius. I don't know how to spell genius. That's ironic, isn't it? It's a chess bing, that thought you have when you just suddenly get that brilliant idea. So we'd like a chess bing to get everything the chess thinker's got. 
We'd like it to have every single thing that Chess Think has got without me having to type it in. If only there was some word I could say that says, just get everything that's got and give it to me. And there is. You say Chess Bing class, Chess Bing extends Chess Thinker. That says, whoa, okay. Chess Bing is everything Chess Think has got. And all that code's copied down, it's all sitting inside there now. And then anything I write inside Chess Bing is in addition to that. So I can write new methods and give it new attributes. But I get all those old ones for free. They're just imported in. But I can't monkey with them or edit them or anything because they're in Chess Thinker. They're not inside Chess Bing. And that's called inheritance. Now, when you have inheritance like that, we get two neat things happening. One neat thing is it gives us code reuse, which was Meyer's, um, Bertram Meyer's original sort of motivation for doing it, which is exciting because we hate repetition. But the other thing it gives us is what we call um, interface inheritance. What we call, yes? Do you only get the public classes? Ah, good question. You get everything from there, it's in here. But code you write in here cannot access the private things. They're hidden from you. But they're there. So if a, method, a public method in here calls a private function, you, you can still call that public method and use that public method. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, what was I saying? OK, so we're done. So uh, everyone knows what you've got to do. I'll see you on Thursday. <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice if time rushed by us like that? Um, what was I doing though? Do you, does anyone remember? Uh, trying to work out how to spell genius. What's that? Explaining, explaining extends. Oh yes, ext thank you. Extends us two things. One is it lets us reuse the code from up here, so it gives us code reuse. But the other thing it does is what? It sets up some relationship between the two, which we call interface inheritance. What's the relationship it sets up between the two? Anyone want to have a hazard a guess? It's an isa. It's a subtyping relationship. So wherever before we could use a chess thinker, can we now supply it with a chess being? Think about it. Can we? Yes, because because. It, it is a chess thinker, yes, that's the real reason, isn't it? And it is one because it, well, the other thing you were saying, it inherits It inherits all its features. All its features, yeah, yeah. All its visible features. It gets its public methods and it gets its public attributes. That's right. So any bit of code expecting to get a chess thinker and it's going to use the functions and attributes of chess thinker, well, chess has got those, so it can do it on chess ping. Now, notice... I sort of did a slight little lie there. Notice the fact it's got the same names and type signatures on the functions means it's a subclass. Remember we talked about subclassing? But is it necessarily a subtype? Do you remember? What's the difference between subclasses and subtypes? That sounds like question one on the exam, doesn't it? What's the, I'm going to write that down on the exam. I'm just keeping the exam here. I don't want anyone to look when I'm not in the room. What are you going to say, George? It's not necessarily a subtype. It's not necessarily a subtype because what's the distinction between a subclass and a subtype? Um, a subclass performs all the legal things which we've set up that it has yes. to be, whereas a subtype is the actual thing. Yes. I, uh, I'll, I'll rephrase that, but that's exactly right, George. Uh, uh, a subclass just has the same methods and the same type signatures. It's a sort of semantic, it's a syntactic equivalence. It's got what it expects. It expects to see this method, that method's there. But a subtype means you can use them interchangeably and it makes sense, which means it fulfills the real contract, the semantic contract. It does the right thing. So the danger would be if somehow I monkeyed around with chess being a bit and I broke the semantic contract. So it, although it still had the functions, they didn't behave in the right way. If I could do that, then it wouldn't be a subtype. And if I could just summarize in advance the problem we're going to see with inheritance is that people use it for code reuse because it's very convenient, not noticing that that also sets up an is a relationship. Well, it sets up a, um, a, a, an inheritance relationship. And other people can then use it as though it's an isa. 
and this leads to disasters if you're just reusing the code and it isn't an isa. Yep. So if you're reusing the code but for a completely different purpose and you're breaking the contract and one really isn't an instance of another, well, now you can use them interchangeably for one for another and Java's going to let it and no one's going to notice till runtime and maybe not even then. So that's just a disaster waiting to happen. So I guess the take home message at the end of the two hours today, I'm going to say, oh, is it, is it just me and my flu or is it really airless and hot in here? And is everyone just shimmering? <laughs> just the pink camel shimmering. Everyone else is okay. Okay, um, so at the end of the two hours, what I'm going to say is um, don't forget, guys, you'll be tempted to use inheritance when you want code reuse, but you must not do that. The only time you can use in inheritance is when you're after code reuse and there is a genuine what? There's a genuine easy relation there. You've got a genuine subtyping thing happening. So please don't use it for one and forget about the other because you're just opening the, you've got two stop signs and one of them saying stop and one saying go. It's just open for disaster now. Yes, I can give an example of that. And we're actually going to go into the code and actually do an, but you want a concrete example now. Um, oh, okay. Well, all right, here we go. Um, I could say, uh, <laughs> Let's do it with uh, ab uh, like computing objects. Suppose I've got, uh, let me just make sure I get it right now, a, a, uh, I've got a priority queue, I write a priority queue. So I've got a class that lets me put objects into it, it's got some sort of add function and inside it, it keeps a collection of objects. And every time I add them, it computes some sort of priority functions and puts them into the right spot in the queue. And the methods for priority queue are enqueue it, dequeue it, to put it in, take it off. How long is the queue? Is the queue empty? Make a queue. Okay. And suppose I wanted to just implement a normal queue. But I didn't have priorities. But I'm feeling lazy. I don't want to write a normal queue. I've got a perfectly good priority queue sitting there. And I think, well, hang on, hang on. Here's what I'll do. I'll set up a normal queue. If only programming was this easy <laughs> during circles. I'll set up a normal queue and I'll say it extends priority queue. So now, boom, it inherits all the priority queue functions. And then I'll, oh, what will I do? I'll make my own add function, nq function. That when someone gives me an object to add, add object O, that method is going to equal um, NQ O I plus plus, where I have some method, uh, some um, private int I equals zero. So I've got some attribute that's hidden to the class, which is a counter, started off at zero. And every time I get an object, I just increase i by one, that gives me the priority of the object. And then I um, add it to the priority queue with that counter as the priority. Now, can you see what's going to happen? That as the prior, as, every time I get a new object, the counter's going to increase by one. So that's going to put the object, oh, are we saying high numbers are high priority or low priority? You tell me. Low, all right, if high numbers are low priority, so the highest priority is the lowest number, which is weird, but sometimes that happens, like number six is, um, is uh, more important than number 10, but not as important as number two, for example, uh, in, in some hypothetical world where everyone had numbers and it indicated their importance. Um, so I'm, I'm number six. It's my lovely badge that I got from someone. Um, so here, what's going to happen is every time you add a new object to the queue, it gets a bigger number given to you as a weight and gets put into the queue. So where will it be put? At the end of the queue, which is exactly what it's supposed to do. So just by running one tiny little line of code, I've managed to convert this guy into a queue and I haven't had to do any pro I inherited it. I'm Jamie Bagger. Okay, I haven't done any work and I get a fantastic working queue. Do you see that? Does that make sense? The code reuse makes sense there? But is it the case 
that a queue is a priority queue? No. Is it the case that a priority queue is a queue? Yeah, it may well be, depending on how you set up things. Yeah, yeah, it may well be. But it's certainly not the case the other way around. But as soon as I've said queue extends priority queue, I'm in trouble now. Because any bit of software that's expecting to be given a priority queue, now I can give it this object. Oh, it's probably still going to work under the way I've done it here. I'd have to bugger it up a bit more. I didn't quite bugger it up. Yeah. If I tried harder to bugger it up, and maybe we could all do that together. <laughs> maybe in my flu-like state, I should have tried really hard to get it correct. <laughs> um, but uh, hypothetically, I can't show you the mechanism for buggering it up just yet. That'll happen in 10 seconds when we talk about overriding functions. Um, but if I did bugger it up in some way, you could see I could hypothetically build this using that. And then someone could get one of these queue objects of mine. And when something's expecting a priority queue, it could be past my queue. And, and the operating system, the compiler, the runtime system, the compiler, nothing would notice that there was a problem. But things might start to break because my, my particular queue might not implement NQ properly. This one does because it just copied it down directly. Wasn't a very compelling example, but that's the shape of what it would look like. Does that make sense? You'd, you'd be lazy, you'd reuse some code to give you a fast solution, but maybe the internal logic of what you're doing doesn't match the internal logic, the semantic contract that's expected for the, the object up here. We call this the superclass and the subclass. That's the super and sub relationship between them, or the parent and the child. So maybe um, this doesn't support the logic that the parent is expecting to have, and so you pass it in instead of a parent, and you cause things to break and airplanes to crash, and, or just people to get served in the wrong order, which is just as bad. Whatever yes? the priority is for that one, the changing it, having the priority we've set down there might just mess up however any Q priority yeah. works. Yes. Well, it, like I don't think at the moment I've... Like yeah, I think... I think at the moment I haven't quite really bugged it up because the old NQ operation is still sitting there and presumably that works. And someone expecting a priority queue is actually only going to use the NQ and they're not going to use my ad, so. Maybe they're lazy and they use that. <laughs> no, but they can't because they're expecting a priority queue, so they can't use an ad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So at the moment I haven't bugged it up enough, but that's the shape of it. Whew. Sorry about that long and not very compelling example. I will give you a better one in a sec. All right. Are there any, question, any more questions about the general thing before we dive into how we actually implement this in Java? Yes? Is there like a way to be lazy and read this code without creating... Ah, like uh, yeah. No, I, I've asked this might be the third time I've asked you your name. I'm sorry. Sean. Sean. Sorry, Sean. Yeah. Your question is, what if you just want to have code reuse and you don't want to have interface reuse? What if you don't actually want to make it an instance of the other thing? Because that's a pain. Yes, there is a way of doing that. What is it called? Copy paste. <laughs> Copy paste. <laughs> it might not be immediately clear, and it's not perfect code reuse, but it gets pretty close to it. Is it it's, it's similar to interfacing. If we talked about it in the same lecture. Oh, oh, sorry, the interfacing does the opposite thing. Interfacing gives you the implementation, the interface reuse, but no code reuse. Inheritance gives you code reuse and interface reuse. If we just want the code to make use of the code, but we don't want to actually make, say this is or that. Abstract. No, it's not abstract class. Or even instantiate an object and use a method in the. No, uh, it might be a solution, but I can't see how it is. It's not what I'm hunting for. There's got to be lots of ways of doing this. It's normally, we're itchy of static things. Um, uh, it's, uh, refactoring would do this. How would you refactor this so you would get to reuse the code? Let's make it concrete. Let's use this actual example, which isn't a very compelling one for the previous one, but it's a very compelling one for this. I want my queue. I want to write queue and I'm too lazy to write a proper queue. And I'd really like to make use of priority queue. Rather than saying a queue is a priority queue and then just trying to tweak it into that, what else could I say? I, no, no, I could say a priority queue is a queue, but that's not going to, it's not going the right way to help me to reuse the code. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Uh, let me rephrase it. Are you saying... You could put all the work in here and then have the inheritance going the other way and then you've solved the problem by having the true is a relationship as well as the code reuse. Sort of, 
you could do that, but maybe it's too hard because maybe this is already out in the wild. And, but, but the question we're trying to answer, that's a clever way of thinking it. The question we're trying to answer is how can you get code re reuse without any interface reuse in either direction? But that, that's quite clever. In this case, that would probably work. Uh, someone said it, I heard. Object, object yes. Yeah, you can have object in the in, inside it. Yeah, we call that delegation. That's right. What's your name? Fred. Fred. Fred's got it exactly right. Why don't we just say, well, the priority queue, uh, why don't we just say, well, the queue has a priority queue inside it. We create a local field called internal priority queue. No one can look at this, private. And then we can do exactly the same trick. Uh, when we do add, we go add object O equals, uh, what do we do? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm doing all Haskell here, aren't I? There's actually curly brackets here. Add object O, then we'd say, if this internal object is called, what are we going to call it? Secret, hidden, inner, priority queue. Then we'd say, secret, hidden, inner, hidden, priority queue, dot, nq. So we just pass it straight through to the other object. And then when someone wants to dequeue it, we'd say, someone says, dear priority queue, I'd like to take an object out. You go, sure, I'll do that. You go over to your, let's suppose it's a slave in a box. Okay, you say, I'm a priority queue. I can't be bothered to be a priority queue. Oh, I'm not a slave, I'm a boss, that's a worker. Okay, so I can't be bothered to be a priority queue, so I employ someone who's a perfectly good priority queue, and I'm a queue, and you say, Richard, add something to the queue, and I go, sure, I'll add something to the queue, I'll add an extra weight on it. Here, put that in the priority queue. And then you'll say, Richard, get something from the queue. And I'll say, sure, I'll get it from my uh, queue. And I'll say, priority queue, give it to me. And I'll just pass it straight back to you. So I'm just like a middleman now. I'm just passing it backwards and forwards. And I'm leaving all the hard work to this guy. That's called delegation. So that's the hazard. Yeah, hazard's heaps better. We love hazard. Because hazard lets you reuse the code, though you can't get your grubby little fingers on it. The code's actually locked in the box. You can only access it through, access it through public functions. So you're going to see later on we can do a bit more, we can get a bit more intimate with the code of this guy when we're inside here if they're inheriting from each other, if it inherits from him. But um, nonetheless, it lets me do most of it. Does it make sense? It is making sense? Did that answer your question? Who asked the question? Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay. And it's Sean. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, the delegation thing, the hazard thing is a great thing. So whenever you've got a choice, if you can do an ISA or a hazard, do a, do a hazard, unless, unless you're really forced to do an ISA. Okay, uh, let's see. Now here's some jargon words you need to know. Subclass, superclass, parent, child. I think you know those words already. Yep. Let me do a quick quiz. I implement an object called, a class called student. And I have a class called tutorial uh, representative for acceptance testing. What's the relationship between these guys? What's a possible relationship? Is one, could one be a superclass of the other? Which would be the superclass? Which would be the subclass? Student or representative? Student. student would be the superclass because a project representative for acceptance testing is a student. There's no doubt about that. Okay, cool. Well done. You passed the test. Now, some people are going to sleep. Why is that? Is that because you've got this terrible cold I've got, or I've given you this terrible cold that I've got, or I'm sleeping so slowly that it's boring, or Java's boring, or the room's airless, or what? What is it? What is it? You can't tell me because you're asleep. Someone's sitting near a sleepy person. Did they mutter something just as they went off? No. Do you want to have a little break now? No. OK. All right. We won't. <laughs> OK. So. Um, We've seen ISA, we've seen code, we've actually done a whole heap of it. We've done all the important stuff. Now we've got to do the syntactical stuff, which, while not as important, is quite vital if you actually want to do this. So in Java, you've seen private and public before. Let's just remember what they mean. If a method or a function is called private, who can access it? Just the class. Just that class. Can other objects in the same class, so suppose you are a student and you are a student, can you access his private function? That was a good answer. And in real life, you can't. But in Java, you can. In Java, you can. So an object, 
can access the private stuff of any other object that's in the same class. So it's sort of like when you're writing, because if you think about it, you're just writing one bit of code. That's the class file. So that one bit of code, in that one bit of code, everything's public to everyone else. So I can access your internal um, uh, data and attributes, and I can call your internal functions and so on and so on. So nothing's hidden from your brothers, essentially. Well, they're not your brothers, they're like uh, you. The, the things that are the same as you. Okay. Public, what does that mean? If I make something public, who can access it? Everyone. Everyone. Okay, good. Can you see that they're pretty much at extremes? I mean, your private could be even more extreme, as you notice, but they're pretty much at extremes. And it turns out there's some things in the middle. Now, there's two more uh, um, uh, protection classes, and we're only going to look at one more of them today. There's one you get that we're not looking at today, which happens when you leave it off, where you don't say whether it's private or public. If you don't say anything at all, well, it gets given a special one. We won't talk about that yet. Default. Default access. Yep. But we won't talk about that now. Um, because it's related to packages, and we won't do packages until after the problem. But the other one that's in the middle is called protected. And protected means this. Oh, no, have a guess. Anyone want to hazard a guess? If you wanted to pick something that was in the middle that was sensible, what's a reasonably sensible um, access privilege sort of thing? It's written up behind me. <laughs> That's fantastic. It's public information. <laughs> it's public information. Private means that only the class. Oh, look at this. Oh, man. In, I've left some words out. That's just half of the course today. Protector means it's public for the current class and subclasses, but private for all other classes. Declaring something as protected is generally a bad design smell. A design smell is something that makes you suspicious. It tends not to be good to use this. Java was, um, oh, thanks, Thurston. Um, Java was initially, uh, I just took my microphone off. How long ago did I take that off? Oh, thank you. <laughs> you, you delegated the answer. <laughs> Um, okay, so how it works is like this, uh, student, class student, class, class representative, student object, student object, student object, student object, student object, class representative object, class representative object, banana, <laughs> okay, banana, you can access public fields, but you cannot access private or protected fields. You can access public fields, but you can't access private or protected fields. You can access um, private fields of any of those guys, public fields of anyone, including the banana, and you can access the protected field of your parent class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So protected means let's just keep it in the family sort of thing. But it's a secret that's inside the family. So we're sort of starting to inch over here where you can see that people can start fouling things up a little bit. Because there could be something protected in here which this guy monkeys with. OK, so we've got the attributes there. And here's some, oh, I wrote a sample piece of code. Let's put that up. Uh, have you noticed, why is this so hard to read? What's the problem with it? One problem with it. It's, it wraps around. I hate that wrapping around. In Java, because variable names can be quite long, because often people only have one variable of each one object for each class that they're talking about, so they give the variable the same name as the class name. You've probably seen that used a lot. So you can just keep track of what the hell's going on because there's so many complicated classes. So sometimes if you've got a, um, I don't know, a Finnegal buffered access reader module, no, a Finnegal access buffer reader and class, and you make an object of class Finnegal access buffer reader, you call it Finnegal access buffer reader. And the class name starts with a capital letter and you make your variable start with a lowercase letter and then everyone knows what's going on. But the problem with that is if you just try and write down Finnegal access buffer reader as a Finnegal access buffer reader, 
straight away you pass the 80 character line limit. So you'll be tempted to do what Rupert's done. I've been into his house. He's taped all his screens in his house and his neighbor's screens together. <laughs> and that way he'll never have to line wrap ever. Um, but what's the problem with that for everyone else? What's that? You don't have that many screens, so when he sends you the file, it just breaks the side of your monitor. <laughs> so you might be tempted to think, oh, I'll just write really wide lines because that's fantastic, but actually it's not so good for sharing. And in Java, code gets shared a fair bit. As you can see, I did here. I wrote these lines way too wide, and now they're not so good for sharing. So we do have dilemmas with line breaks and variable names, and that's a real style problem that we'll have to grapple with and think about. So here we go. We've got um, a public class called base. It's got a private variable, a public variable, and a protected variable with very um, descriptive names. They're all ints. Extended base extends base. So what does it get hold of? Well, it gets hold of everything. What can it access? It can access a public thing, because that's its parents. It can access its parents' protective variables. But if we try and do this, that's actually going to throw a compile error. Yep, because we can't access our parents' private variables. And if we write a test class, which has no relationship at all with base, we can only access public and protected and private will all throw compile errors. So if you compile that, you'll see that. OK. Um, I've got three more jargony words to tell you, and then we might do something. Jargony word number one is, what order did I write them in? Abstract. <laughs> it's quite funny. When, when I was learning Java, I just kept giggling. Because every time I turned the page, there was more stuff. And I thought, the guys just went to town. There's just so many ways of doing everything. They just got excited. I reckon everyone got in a room and said, how should we do object orientation? And someone said, oh, man, we should have interfaces. Oh, yeah, we'll have interfaces. Oh, we should have abstract classes. Oh, we'll have abstract classes. Oh, we should have this. Oh, we'll put it all. And they just put it all in. And, then, uh, and that was Java. So there's lots of things that are all subtly different but closely related. And the sort of design question that I hope will be running through your brain as I initially put them, show you now, and then as you continue to use them over the rest of the course, and hopefully over the rest of your life as a programmer, is, gee, when is it best to use this one, and when is it best to use that one? Because they're almost the same, but they're subtly different. So there's a different sort of class you can have called an abstract class. And you're just going to put the word abstract in front of the class. So you can say something like, abstract class Fred, blah, blah, blah. And you're going to define an abstract class. Well, it's going to behave a lot like a real class. So let's, let's build up to that. How are we going to see it? OK, here's what we're going to do. Um, you remember I told you that every object is inherited from, every, sorry, every class is inherited in a hierarchy from one big class or one central class. Do you remember that? What was that central class called? Object. So there was this class called object, and every other class we write has sort of um, got extends object implicitly written after it. And object, a few things extend object, and then things extend those things. But that means everything is a object, which is grammatically incorrect. <laughs> but your model is an exactly the same way. Uh, everything is an object. And then that means. Now you understand how inheritance works. That means that everyone, every single object, what does it get automatically? It gets what? Why does it get its equals? Object has its equals as a method, and it's a public method. So all its children get access to it. So that means every object gets an, every class you ever write, every object of every class you'd ever write, gets an is equals method. And it's just the method that's defined in object. And what else does every single um, class you ever write get automatically for free? To string. to string. It gets to string because object has to string. And remember, to string has um, the type signature to uh, string takes an object. Uh, uh, oh, oh, sorry. It returns a string to string and it takes an object in. Oh, no, it doesn't take anything in. <laughs> eventually got it right. So every object has a method called the string that returns a string that represents the object. And it's defined in objects, so you don't have to bother to write it yourself. You inherit that function for free. You don't have to write it, which is wonderful. But unfortunately, has anyone fooled around with to string? 
If you make your own class and then try and print it out, what do you get? A whole lot of gibberish. It's giving you crap. Because the generic, general, all-purpose to string function that object has, that we all inherit, is pretty general and hopeless. I think it just gives you an, I'm just, I don't even know what it gives you. Does it give you an access into the symbol table where the class definition is stored? Or, does anyone know what it actually gives you? Not defined to be anything. It can be whatever it wants. But it gives you the address of what? It gives the name of the address. It gives you the address of the object in, in hex or something. OK. And it gives you the name of the object as well? And it adds a name. In, and then ID? It gives you a hash value for it, maybe? Or? It gives you an object ID and it gives its address. So it's this long, ugly string in hexadecimal. But if you've got a pawn and you want to print out the pawn, you might have wanted to print out as a beautiful ASCII description of a pawn. Uh. So this ugly hexadecimal representation is no good. I'm just going to move right on. So I'm just sick, OK? You gotta, no, I mean, I'm not well. <laughs> God, I'm going. <laughs> they told me about this at lecture school. I didn't. I said it would happen. Okay. Um, so, when you print out your rook, you want it to print out in an attractive ASCII fashion. So you would like to string, not to print out an ugly thing like that, but to print out an ASCII representation. So in other words, although they're giving you a two string, I mean, isn't this always the way? You say, Mum and Dad, I'd like a guitar for my birthday. Sure, we're a family. You can inherit my guitar. I don't want your guitar. I want an electric guitar. No, you inherit my guitar. So although they give you something for free, maybe it's not what you want. So we have this ability in Java to override it. It still has to be there because we've got the is a relationship. So we're constrained to have a function of that type signature and that returns that value. But we're not constrained to use their implementation. If we want, we can write our own. So inside any class you write, you can actually write string to string um, return hello. It's not terribly useful. And now whenever anyone tries to print out that object, it'll print out hello. This definition of to string has overridden the default definition of to string that you've inherited. Does that make sense? Now we're starting to see how objects can foul things up. Because a child can redefine any of its parents by overwriting, overriding any of its parents' public or protected functions. And then any code running in the parent that calls those functions, in the parent code that you've inherited that calls those functions now causes your variance, now calls your variance of those functions. Does that make sense? So although the initial functions you get from your parents satisfy the invariance and satisfy the contract, and if you just got those and didn't monkey with them, you would be an ISA, because you've got exactly those functions. Because you can monkey with them and override them and change them, actually you're no longer constrained for it to be an ISA. So that's called overriding. So often what some people would do is they'd grab a class that has almost exactly what they want, they'd extend it, grab all its code, and they'd just override the few functions that aren't quite exactly right. That's what you're tempted to do. And I guess my, the moral that I'm going to tell you at the end of the lecture, and let me say it again now, is only do that if there really is and is a relationship between them. Because Java doesn't have something extends but not really keyword. It doesn't have something like that that lets you grab the code and not establish the is a relationship, not establish a, a sub-class uh, relationship. So does that mean that with your example before about the queue, if you wrote NQ, a function NQ, then yes. the NQ and the other one would work? Yes, yes, thank you very much. Um, so if, did I leave it here or have I rubbed it out? Oh, I rubbed it out. Oh, can I repeat that for everyone? He said, in the example before we had with Q and NQ, uh, with Q and priority Q, um, does that mean if I was a Q inheriting from Oh, I better write it. I'll get it all wrong, won't I? We've already written PQ, and it's got NQ and DQ. Oh, sounds a bit cryptic, doesn't it? And that's our class. 
We now want to write Q. What we could do is we could say it extends PQ, and now boom, boom, we get everything, and the only thing I've got to change is my, what do I have to change? I have to change NQ, don't I? Yeah, I change NQ. So what I want to say now is NQ, I write my own type signature of NQ, whatever it is, and I write my own version of NQ here, and that is going to override the version of NQ that's up there. Now, it's going to face this with a, a slight problem, possibly, because maybe I actually want this one to call that one. Can you see I might want to do that? I'm, now I'm going to have to write the whole function. I'm going to have to look at the code in here and re repeat all that code. And I'm going to have to hope that it doesn't actually fool around with any private things because I can't access them. And I might, be, might think, oh, I don't want to actually have to rewrite the whole function. I really just want to add that one little change that we did before. Add an, um, give it my own priority level. And then I want to pass that to the parents function. So I want my own guitar and the parents guitar. And I want when the outside world calls guitar, they get my guitar. But I'd like my guitar to actually call the parents guitar. Does that make sense? And then I'd have to write the parents guitar. And lo and behold, is that the next thing we've got here? No, here. Not the final one. The final one. Um, there's a keyword called super. And if I say super.guitar, whose guitar am I talking about? Dad's guitar. That's right. And if I say super.nq, who's, who am I talking about? The NQ function of, of the parent. Okay. So it's still my function in my object, but my object now has two functions called NQ. One I got for free from my parents, and one I wrote myself. And if I want to use the parents one, I have to say super.nq. And if I want to use my one, I don't have to say anything, but I'll probably say this.nq. Yeah. Okay, is that cool? So yes, in other words, is the answer to your question yes. That was spot on. So now it all makes sense to you, the whole mucking up thing? Yeah. yeah. In fact, that might be an interesting exercise to do at home, to try and set up yourself a class that does something useful, and then create a child of that class that inherits from the class, and see what you can do as a child to bugger it all up. So it looks like you do it right, but you've stuffed it up. That would be a, an interesting and fun thing to do. And do it as simply in as few lines as you can. See if you can find a really compelling example, and then next year I can steal that and use that to explain it to next year's lot. And I have, in fact, delegated to you the task of finding good lecture examples. Is that cool? Yes. All right. And the last thing to talk about is final. The final keyword, have a guess. In this context of superclassing, of subclassing other people, of extending other people, in other words, this context of overriding other people's functions, inheriting to stuff from your parents and either choosing to throw it away, with, replace it with your own stuff, or have them both there and get the best of both worlds. What do you think the word final might mean? This is the end. end. Alright, what could be the end? What are we going to stop? When your parents put the foot down and say, this is final, what do they mean? No more children. No more children. <laughs> <laughs> I like the way you're thinking there. No, it doesn't mean that at all. Children are great especially babies and the poems they inspire. And I did find some fantastic baby poems. Uh, has anyone written a crap poem? Remember I gave you that homework in week one? Oops. Oh, I see. It's one of those acrostic programs. Object-oriented programming succeeds. That wasn't a very good one, though. So that, was, that filled all our criteria. So I'd like everyone now to have a little break, just for five minutes, and I'd like everyone to write a very bad program, please. A poem. <laughs> The bad program is the project. This is just a little mini thing. I'd like you to write. It's not a bad program. Your project is fantastic. I'm very excited by them. I wish I hadn't said that now. My project. So can everyone write a bad poem? And after the break, because we're having a five minute break now, I will randomly pick someone and you better have a really crap answer for me at that stage. Okay, go, go, go.